Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter Jr., Dan Friedel, and Brian Lynn. Later, Katie Weaver and Ashley will bring us the next part in our series on America's National Parks. But first, here is Mario Ritter Jr. Brazil's Rondônia state is home to rainforests and at least three different native groups. The area has also faced serious problems like deforestation. So when Brazilian reporter Gustavo Falieros learned of an illegal attempt to take land away from a huge protected area in the state, he used his reporting skills to bring attention to it. The Uru e Wawau Indigenous Reserve in Rondonia is spread over 18,000 square kilometers. It holds land used by many of Brazil's native or indigenous people. When I did the stories about the invasion of indigenous land, I felt it was really contributing to bring attention to that specific place. Falierus said. A grant from the Pulitzer Center's Rainforest Journalism Fund, or RJF, permitted Falierus to travel to Rondonia and report. The Pulitzer Center is an organization that gives financial support to journalists around the world. Falierus' work was included in an RJF investigation into threats to the environment and indigenous communities in Latin America. Falierus now runs the Pulitzer's Rainforest Investigations Network. Reporters from several countries in the network work together to investigate issues like climate change and corruption. The Pulitzer Center started RJF in 2018 to aid reporting on the Amazon Basin, the Congo Basin, and Southeast Asia. The center plans to produce 200 environmental journalism stories through the RJF by 2023. Nora Moraga Louie is the manager of the RJF. She said her group gives journalists the chance to report on stories that would not be written without its help. In addition to financial support, reporters are given training and access to a network of other journalists. At the Pulitzer Center, we view journalism as a tool for empowering the public to engage in global issues and understand where their community fits in, Moraga Louis said. Moraga Louis said the center's work brings attention to the threats facing rainforests and the forces that influence them over short and long periods of time. She added that the reporting seeks to find answers to problems that should have more attention or support. Strengthening local journalism is also an important part of RJF's work. The center does its best to find local reporters. 
Local journalism can help spread important information, share knowledge, and build connections within communities that help bring change, she said. However, there are real difficulties with environmental reporting, Falieros said. For example, it can be hard to get community members to talk. Falieros said people directly hurt by illegal forestry and mining are the most at risk from speaking to reporters. These are the guys who know a lot about the local context and can point out who is behind the environmental problems, Falieros said. Although it is very important to speak to local community members, if anyone is identified as a source, they can face serious actions. Talking with locals requires being honest with people and understanding why someone might not want to talk. Reporting on rainforest destruction often means looking into corruption, organized crime, violence, and human rights violations. When there is a risk of danger, Falieros said the Pulitzer Center helps with security. He has not been directly threatened himself, but he knows there are dangers. Many of these rainforest countries are the ones with the biggest levels of violence, both for activists and journalists, he said. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Historic cultural artifacts are returning to Afghanistan. U.S. officials seized 33 Afghan pieces worth $1.8 million from a New York art collector. Officials say the man stole artifacts from countries all over the world. Roya Rahmani is Afghanistan's ambassador to the U.S. She says the recovery of the material is extremely important to the country's culture. Each one of these pieces are priceless depictions of our history, she said. The Manhattan District Attorney along with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, recovered the artifacts as a part of an investigation into the illegal sale of antiquities. Rachmani formally took back the pieces from the U.S. on April 12th. The items include masks and sculptures some from the 2nd and 3rd centuries. They were on display for a short period of time at the Afghan embassy in Washington, D.C. They will be placed in the Afghanistan National Museum in Kabul. The National Museum of Kabul is the place where members of the Taliban destroyed artifacts in 2001, the group believes human images are offensive. The Taliban is now out of power, but it controls much of the country outside of Kabul. Peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government have slowed down, and U.S. and NATO troops are expected to leave the country after 20 years of war. 
Rahmani says it's a dangerous time for the country. However, what I know is that our security forces are determined to defend our people. The government is committed to do its part for peace, she said. Before 9-11, the Taliban had become infamous for its strict form of Islamic law. Under the Taliban, most art and culture was banned, and women were not allowed in public. In 2001, the Taliban destroyed 6th century statues of the Buddha built into the side of a cliff in Bamiyan province. Rahmani says the items are returning to an Afghan government that respects their culture and history. She says the Taliban would never destroy the precious artifacts again. Our security forces and our government would not let that happen, she said. Like the statues, some of the recovered antiquities are of the Buddha. There's also a statue of Shiva and a Greek mask. Frederick Hebert is an archaeologist who is an expert on Afghanistan. He says the artifacts show the many cultural influences on the country, which was once a worldwide center for trade. Afghanistan is one of the richest countries in archaeology and history in the world, he said. For 6,000 years, there's been civilization based in Afghanistan. That makes Afghanistan a good target for those who want to steal. I'm Dan Friedel. A growing number of U.S. companies are now offering homes built with three-dimensional or 3D printing technology. The companies say 3D printers can build homes faster, for a lot less money, and in a much more environment-friendly way than traditional building methods. They say the technology may also help solve America's shortage of affordable housing. 3D printers make physical objects based on 3D models created by a computer. The machines put down many thin layers of material, such as plastic, metal, or concrete, on top of each other. Objects are created through this process from the bottom up. In recent years, 3D printers have mostly been used to create small, specialized items. This includes parts for automobiles, airplanes, and medical devices. Many consumer products can also be 3D printed as well, from clothes to foods. Now, an increasing number of startup companies are using 3D printing to build entire homes. Since the technology is still developing, not many have yet been built. However, the top companies plan to greatly increase production in coming years. The startup company Icon, based in Austin, Texas, made news in 2018 by completing the first permitted 3D-printed home in the U.S. At the time, 
It said the home had been built in just a day. Since then, the company says it has been developing new technologies in robotics, software, and manufacturing materials. It designed its own 3D printer and says the robot powered machine can create structures up to 185 square meters. The printing process uses a cement based mixture that Icon says is stronger and less costly than traditional building materials. To date, Icon has completed 24 3D printed homes in the U.S. and Mexico. Among them was a community of 3D printed homes in a poor neighborhood in Mexico. The company has also completed a series of structures for homeless people in Austin. And it says it plans to open America's first housing development of 3D printed homes this summer. Icon co founder Jason Ballard told the Associated Press his company's 3D printing system can reduce construction costs by up to 30% and produce a home twice as fast as traditional methods. The process can do the work of 10 to 20 workers in several different fields. The machines, unlike humans, can work 24 hours a day. Sam Rubin is the co founder of another home building company, Mighty Buildings. With 3D printing, we're able to print exactly what we need, he told the AP. The company uses a 3D printer in Oakland, California to produce all parts, which are shipped to the side of the home. The house can then be put together with simple tools, Rubin said. Mighty Buildings advertises several home models on its website. A complete mid size home up to 65 square meters costs $187,250. The company also produces 32 square meter Mighty Studios that start at $115,000. The smaller structures are designed to be used as extra bedrooms, home offices, etc. Rubin said the prices are about 40% lower than traditional homes. He added that the 3D printing process removes nearly all building waste, which can save up to three tons of carbon per home. The company has a goal of producing 1,000 structures next year. It has teamed up with a developer to complete a solar powered community of 3D printed homes in the California desert. Orders have already been sold out with 500 people on a waiting list. A New York company, SQ4D, also uses 3D printing technology to build homes. In February, The company showed off a 130 square meter model home to demonstrate its printer's abilities. SQ4D plans to sell its homes starting at $299,000. The company has even started listing the homes on the internet selling site Zillow. I'm Brian Lynn. Today, on our National Parks journey, we head to the far western part of Texas. The landscape here is severe. The Chisos Mountains rise from the desert. The Rio Grande River 
cuts deep into ancient limestone rock. Cactus plants flower under the intense sun. Welcome to Big Bend National Park. At first sight, Big Bend seems empty of life, but the park is home to many plants and animals. Over 450 kinds of birds can be found within the park, along with 75 mammal species and more than 50 kinds of reptiles. The park's diversity comes from its three different ecosystems. Within the park are mountain, desert, and river environments. The Rio Grande sustains the park. The river starts high up in the Rocky Mountains. Melting mountain snow is its main source. It travels more than 3,000 kilometers on its way to the Gulf of Mexico. The river cuts through the dry Chihuahuan Desert. Big Bend National Park contains the northernmost part of this desert. It is the second largest desert in North America. Much of the desert is south of the border in Mexico. The Rio Grande serves as an international border between the United States and Mexico for about 1,600 kilometers. The park itself shares a border with Mexico for 189 kilometers. The Chihuahuan Desert is the largest ecosystem in the park. 80% of the park is desert. Animals like jackrabbits, roadrunner birds, and mule deer live in the Chihuahuan. Many cactus and yucca species thrive. These are succulent plants. Most succulents have thick, heavy leaves that store water. Cacti store water in their stems. High up in the park's Chisos Mountains, you will find fir and pine trees, aspens and maples. Temperatures here are much cooler than down on the desert floor. The entire Chisos mountain range exists within Big Bend. It is the only mountain range in the United States that is fully within a national park. Its highest mountains, Emory Peak and Lost Mine Peak, each rise more than 2,000 meters above the hot desert floor. The woodland environment in the mountains is home to black bears, mountain lions, and gray foxes. It is also home to many kinds of birds. Visitors are drawn to the park because of its rare and unique bird species. One of these is the Colima warbler. These small gray, yellow, and red birds arrive at Big Bend in the springtime to mate and nest. Then they return south to Mexico. In the late summer, mountain sage flowers appear. Hummingbirds, blue-throated, ruby-throated, Magnificent and Lucifer seek out these flowers. Along with its plant and animal life, the park is also rich in cultural history. Archaeological records of humans in the area go back about 10,000 years, beginning with the prehistoric Paleo Indians. Later on, the Chisos Indians lived here, as did the Comanche and Jumano people and other native groups. 
Spanish explorers began to arrive in the area in the 1500s. They were searching for gold and fertile land. They described this land as despoblado, or uninhabited. Much of what is now Big Bend National Park was Mexican territory until 1848. Mexican settlers farmed and raised animals here. In the early 1900s, many Anglo-Americans began settling in the area. Big Bend became a national park on June 12th 1944. It covers more than 320,000 hectares. President Franklin D. Roosevelt established the park just one week after D-Day. That is the day American and British troops invaded Normandy, France. As America's attention centered on World War II, Roosevelt established a new national park for future generations to enjoy. For several years before the park was created, hundreds of men worked to build roads and trails to prepare the area for visitors. They built the 11-kilometer road that leads to the Chisos Mountains Basin. A basin is a large area of the Earth's surface that is lower than the area surrounding it. Today, the basin is a popular place within the park. Visitors can stay in the Chisos Mountain Lodge there or at campgrounds. Many of the park's hiking trails begin near the basin. One of the most popular is the Lost Mine Trail. It starts near the Chisos Mountain Lodge. The trail goes up sharply through forests of pine, juniper, and oak trees. The eight-kilometer-long hike passes by lookout points for viewing Casa Grande Peak, one of Texas's major mountains. Hikers can also enjoy a view into the park's Juniper Canyon. More than 300,000 people visit Big Bend each year. Most come between November and April, when the weather is cooler. A favorite way to explore the park is by boat on the Rio Grande. Many tour operators organize rafting trips. Rafting trips take you through many kilometers of beautiful deep canyons. They may last half a day or several days. On longer trips, travelers sleep next to the river in tents. Another way to enjoy the Rio Grande is in its many hot springs. These are places where hot water flows up from underground. The water temperature is over 40 degrees Celsius. The river's hot springs are said to have healing properties. They hold mineral salts from the earth. Big Bend National Park has offered beauty, excitement, and recreational challenge to visitors for more than 80 years. It is a true treasure of Texas and the larger United States. I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.